Good day. Welcome to the Great White North. It's great, it's white, it's north. It's also known as Canada, a nation of just over 9 million square kilometers, and 40% of its landmass is considered Arctic. The coldest temperature ever documented in our refrigerated nation was minus 63 degrees Celsius, or for our southern neighbors, that's minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. That was back in February of 1947 in Snag, Yukon. Today it's a bit warmer, still very cold though. Now it takes a lot of dedication to press a cold conducting hunk of metal against your face for such long periods in this cold weather. And even if you're willing to endure a frostbitten finger or two to capture a few photos, your camera may not be as willing. What follows are a few tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years that will help you capture photos in extreme cold. Anyone who has spent significant time outdoors in the cold knows your body needs more energy in order to stay warm. In fact, you need to consume roughly 4,500 calories to endure a day at minus 30 degrees Celsius. And your camera also has increased energy demands in the cold, or rather your camera battery won't be retaining its full charge. A lithium ion camera battery at room temperature of 27 degrees Celsius holds 100% of its charge, but at minus 18 degrees Celsius, it only retains 50% of its charge. And the colder it gets, the less charge your camera batteries will be holding. There are two simple means of combating the reduced power delivery of those batteries, and they're both very easy to practice. The first is the most obvious. Simply bring more batteries. In fact, bring twice as many as you typically would bring. And if you know you're going somewhere cold like the Arctic, the Antarctic, or Saskatchewan, it's worth investing in more batteries. In fact, buy more batteries than you think are necessary because they will save your butt. Now the second solution requires a bit of role play. You're going to take on a Wolf of Wall Street persona, treating your batteries like stacks of Bordens or Benjamins, and you're smuggling them through airport security by strapping them to your body. Okay, you don't actually have to duct tape your camera batteries to your body, but the closer you can keep those batteries to your body heat, the warmer they will stay and the more charge they will retain. So if you're working outside for an extended period, keep your batteries in the inner pocket of your jacket so they stay warm. And if you're spending the night outside in a tent, you're gonna be sharing your sleeping bag with some rather awkward and painful companions. Picking up your camera and pressing it against your face at 30 below is going to require some forethought. Most photographers are familiar with the annoying nose smudge, created by looking through the viewfinder and your nose inevitably is pressed against that rear LCD screen, leaving behind a gross oily smudge. Now at 30 below, when you've got that ever-present pesky drip at the end of your nose, the nose smudge is replaced by a nose-sized patch of ice. It obscures the LCD screen, and if it's a touch screen, it's pretty much useless. Now the only real way of avoiding this is making a concerted effort not to let your nose touch the LCD screen of the camera. The camera, as well as your nose, will thank you. After spending a day outside shooting in the cold, you need to prepare your camera gear for the upcoming change in temperature. So before you rush inside to the warmth of your igloo, take the flash card and battery out of your camera, take the camera, put it inside a Ziploc or any other type of airtight bag. If you didn't bring one, your camera bag will do. Once all your gear is inside a bag, take it all indoors with you and leave it there undisturbed for the next few hours. This allows the air temperature inside the bag to slowly acclimatize, matching the air temperature outside. You may see condensation form on the outside of the bag, but don't worry, be reassured there's nothing forming inside. Your camera is dry. This is a process not worth rushing. If you bring your camera directly indoors from the cold without any preventative measures, condensation may form inside your camera and that can do some damage. Now, if you know you're quickly transitioning from a cold, dry environment to a warm, humid environment, it's worth being proactive in the battle against condensation. If you're a budget-minded photographer like myself, start collecting the desiccant packs you find in shoe boxes and other random new products put those desiccants inside that airtight plastic bag. Alternatively, these lens and body caps from BRNO are also a great preventative measure.
If you're planning on capturing time-lapse imagery in the depths of winter, you need to prepare your camera for the prolonged cold, paying specific attention to the lens. If left unattended for long durations, the front element is very susceptible to condensation and frost accumulation. Now, the solution does seem a bit primitive, but it really does work. To start, you need some tape. You need a couple of those chemical reaction pocket warmers and a sock, preferably one of your grandpa's old knee-high socks. Compose your frame as desired and use a bit of the tape to lock off both the zoom and the focus ring of the lens. Activate the pocket warmers and stick them inside the sock, wrap the sock around the lens, and again, use more tape to secure it all in place. Double check you haven't accidentally bumped the camera and altered your composition. When you're happy with it, begin your intervalometer. Now the success of this technique does vary depending on how cold it is, how humid the environment is, and how long your camera will be spending outdoors. Generally speaking, your actual camera is going to be one of the very last things to encounter problems because of the cold, and it's not likely ever to stop working completely. What you may encounter is the LCD screens becoming a little sluggish. The liquid crystals inside those screens won't freeze completely, but they do slow down significantly, making them very awkward to work with. Change a dial to adjust shutter speed or aperture, and be prepared to wait for those changes to be reflected in the screen. Even more frustrating is the latency experience while capturing video. Movement within your frame has a blurred and ghosting appearance, making panning and focusing very challenging. Looking past Mother Nature's beautiful white gown, winter offers some of the best shooting conditions imaginable. The cold air is cleaner, it holds less moisture, and that creates sharper images, especially at longer focal lengths. As an added bonus, the winter sun never strays too far from the horizon, which creates more dramatic shadows throughout the entire day and better light angles. And the days are shorter, which means you don't have to wake up at a ridiculous hour to catch sunrise, and sunset is long before dinner time. Both tripods taste the same, however, one offers the same midwinter experience as licking the schoolyard flagpole. Ow. Hold on. Oh, double double to the rescue. Aluminum tripods are easily one of the most dreaded aspects of cold weather photography. Handling one without gloves or mittens is a surefire means of experiencing frostbite. And even with a great pair of mitts, it's really painful to hold. Now, carbon fiber doesn't conduct cold well and is much more comfortable to use in the cold. However, if you've ever read the tiny owner's manual that comes with your carbon fiber tripod, there's a warning about extreme temperatures. In the cold, carbon fiber is susceptible to cracking or shattering. Now, you can get leg warmers to help mitigate the risk of that happening, and hopefully that helps, or you could buy a wooden tripod. Beyond the technical logistics of capturing photos in the cold, there are a few things to consider prior to pressing your shutter button, mainly how to photograph snow. Snow may be white, but you should never use it to set your white balance. For that, you need a proper white card. If you're in a pinch and you don't have a white card, set your camera's white balance to the cloudy preset, and that should do the trick. Relying on your camera's automatic white balance results in bluer or cooler color temperatures, which can be beneficial if you're trying to convey a cold feeling. Additionally, a composition comprised primarily of snow, such as this one, is going to fool your camera's meter into underexposing. So if you're shooting in aperture or shutter priority, adjust your exposure compensation accordingly. Now it is a fine line between overexposing and underexposing snow, so it is best that you get it right in the camera and not rely on raw adjustments in post-processing.
really, really cold temperatures, let's say anything below 40 degrees Celsius, your gear becomes rather fragile. This is something I experienced firsthand while working in Joe Haven at temperatures below 50 degrees Celsius. Microphone shock mounts shattered, metal zipper tabs broke as if they were made of plastic, XLR cables snapped in half. The only way to prevent pieces of your gear breaking in the cold is by using extra care. If something becomes stuck, a mount, a zipper, don't use extra force. That goes for your eyelids as well. Before wrapping up, I'm gonna quickly rattle off a handful of easy do's and don'ts. Although I suppose most of them are don'ts. Don't change memory cards over deep snow. If you drop it, it's gone for good. Do it over your camera bag. If you drop it there, it's in your bag. Snow on your lens, don't blow on it. Your warm, humid breath will coat the front element in frost. Use a rocket blower instead. Don't carry your camera under your jacket. The slightest perspiration creates a sauna. Carry it in your bag, that's what you brought it for. Don't bring your camera indoors with snow on it. Make a concerted effort to clean your camera of any snow, frost, or moisture. Don't allow any snow to find its way inside your camera bag. Moisture here can condense on your gear once in a warmer environment. Finally, the single most important part of capturing photos in the extreme cold has nothing to do with your camera at all. It's all about taking care of yourself, dressing appropriately so you stay nice and toasty the entire time you're outdoors. If you get cold, you're not going to enjoy what you're doing. You're not going to want to take photos, believe me. So that means wearing many layers. More. More. Keep going. Good enough. Don't even bother wearing cotton. If it gets wet or damp, you're gonna freeze. Wool is going to be your best friend. It may not be clothing, but as I mentioned off the top, you need to consume a crazy amount of calories just to stay warm in the cold. So make sure you're packing plenty of snacks wherever you're going. And a cold, dry environment is going to suck the moisture from your skin. And that can lead to dehydration. So make sure you're drinking ample water throughout the day. Oh, and here in the Great White North, this is a toque, you should wear one. As a photographer, I cannot imagine hibernating through the cold and not heading outdoors to capture photos of winter's beauty. And hopefully through this video, I've showed you that with the right preparation, it is possible. So the next time you think of visiting the Arctic, the Antarctic, or the Great White North, try and remember what I've showed you throughout this video. Uh, if you like this video, click like. If you think I've missed something, you've got your own suggestion for cold weather photography, put it in the comments below, and thanks for watching.